Singer. I'm the adult programs coordinator for the Kellogg Hubbard Library. We're very happy to have you here tonight. Welcome to the library. We're pleased to be partnering with the League of Women Voters once again this year for their speaker series. We're glad to have them here. We're glad to have the panel. Um, if you need anything, please let me know. The restrooms are, the restroom is in the back of the room. Good time to shut off your cell phones now. And um, I'm going to check the other mic and then head to the panel. Okay. Okay, here's the tester for this mic. Also good? Okay. So welcome. And thank you for coming out on such a cold fall night uh, for this discussion of prison health care. It's part of the League of Women Voters uh, annual series, annual library series. This year, 2019 and 2020, it's on criminal justice. I'm Madeline Mongan, a member of the League of Women Voters. Before we begin, I want to quickly thank our partners. First of all, the Kellogg Covered Library and Michelle Singer, who support these discussions and give them a home. And also the ACLU, Disability Rights Vermont. We have two speakers from Disability Rights Vermont here today. The Peace and Justice Center and the Vermont Women's Commission. Our partners help us get the word out about these talks and contribute to them in many ways. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan organization that was founded about 100 years ago at a time of women's suffrage. It's open to men and women, sometimes people get confused about that, and its mission is to empower voters and defend democracy. We have nonpartisan volunteer projects to register voters at high schools, colleges, prisons, swearing in ceremonies for new Americans, and other events. We advocate for evidence based positions at the State House. And this year, we're leading a statewide, year-long commemoration of 100 years of women's suffrage. Sign up if you're interested in any of these, joining us in any of these projects. Tonight, we are very fortunate to have an outstanding moderator for our panel. Susan Clark is a League of Women Voters member, first of all. She's a writer and educator focusing on community sustainability and engagement. She's co-author of Slow Democracy, Bringing Decision-Making Back Home, and All Those in Favor, a book about Vermont town meetings. Susan consults with communities across the Northeast on how to build inclusive, deliberative, and empowered public engagement. If you're curious about public engagement, Slow Democracy has examples of public engagement and deliberative decision-making in action. Susan serves as the town moderator of Middlesex, Vermont, so I'm gonna turn it over to her, and we'll begin, thank you again. Thank you. Thanks so much for that wonderful introduction. We have a fantastic panel with us. So much wisdom up here. It's going to be really great. And uh, my only my only hard job is going to be to uh, somehow funnel it funnel it all in because I know it's, there's so much to to do here. Um, maybe you can just wave when I say your name. Emily Trudeau is the supervising uh, attorney. Um, at the Prisoner's Rights Office of the Defender General. Um, Dr. Dolores Burroughs Byron, who I understand goes by D, uh, former health director for Vermont's Department of Corrections. Tina Hagen is the senior <coughs> investigator with Disability Rights Vermont. And Ed Paquin is executive director of Disability Rights Vermont. And last but not least, Judy Jenkins, deputy. Okay. Hankin, no S. Hankin, thank you. Hankin. <laughs> Although an alias is always good in crowds sometimes. Just in case. <laughs> <laughs> Deputy Commissioner of the Vermont Department of Corrections. Um, so we have a uh, handful of questions that uh, the League has uh, asked us to cover, um, which you guys all know about. And we were discussing beforehand that maybe the, the best way to start before we dive into some of the meat here is to just take maybe two minutes each um, to set the stage, um, because those were tiny little introductions of who you are and what you do, um, if there were one or two pieces of wisdom that each of you could impart to us uh, that would really help us lay the foundation of this discussion, um, help us understand uh, you know, our, our, our topic more fully, um, what would it be? Um, and Really, you can go in any order, um, but the, the, the and you might want to sort of feed off each other in, the, in, in a way. But um, just a couple of minutes each to to set the stage for us. I'll volunteer. 
Good man. And the reason I'll volunteer, oops, here we go. Okay, the reason I'll volunteer is that what I had thought I would do, rather than talk about what disability rights would do and does um, in, in our role in uh, monitoring conditions and working with inmates and prisoners, uh, because Tina does more of that directly than I do. What I want to just point out is a few of the basics of where the rights of a prisoner to what we feel is the standard of health care that they are, are due by right. And for, from the federal level, um, Article 8 of the Constitution is, uh, says that excessive bail shall not be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishments inflicted. And those, uh, that's an expansion of some of the previous amendments, and that's the amendment from which the basic interpretation that a, that a convict who has, uh, that a person who has been convicted of a crime and is incarcerated by the state or the federal government, um, they have a right to freedom from uh, cruel and unusual punishment and withholding of health care has been uh, shown over the years of jurisprudence to be, to be uh, a cruel and unusual punishment. For detainees, in Vermont, our prison system is very different than, than many, and we have a mix in our state prisons of people that are convicted of a crime and people who are presumptively innocent until proven, and they are, they are detained. And for them, Article 14's protection of nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. It's, that's the clause from which is interpreted the right of a detainee to, uh, to health care, to reasonable treatment, to due process, and a number of other things. But, but health care <coughs> in, in prisons are there by right, and it comes from our Constitution at the federal level. On the state level, You'll, you'll hear me and other advocates talk about what is it that a, that a prisoner is, is entitled to. And you'll see, I use the term prisoners. They're, they're in prison. That, and when I say prisoner, I'm including convicts and detainees, both. So just so you know what I mean when I'm using that term. So there, the department shall provide health care for inmates in accordance with prevailing medical standards. Now, the way we interpret that, that, is a, that means medical care should reach the community standard. So in other words, if um, a person has a diagnosis of an illness, uh, whether it be a mental illness or a physical illness, and the prevailing standard in the community is X, that should would be what they are entitled to as a, as a prisoner, um, not necessarily X minus something. So that's, that's the standpoint from which we come. There's some other important um, statutes that deal with people who have serious functional impairments, which are people who have very serious mental illnesses, serious traumatic brain injuries, or, or serious developmental disabilities. There are other aspects, or there are other um, uh, situations that require the state to look at their situation a little bit differently that come from Vermont statute. And there are a few statutes regarding segregation of inmates that um, look at a little differently at the category of someone who has a functional impairment. Um, they're supposed to be only uh, held in segregation no longer than 15 days if they have um, a disciplinary report or 30 days if they have an administrative uh, segregation. Okay. So those are just, I just wanted to convey some of the basics. Um, where does the law protect the individual's right to uh, uh, medical care at what we would interpret as a community standard? Great. Is there a natural um, can, I, can I just add one thing? I'd be happy to just give a little background on, on what our system is like, what the correctional system is like. 
Um, I'm Judy Henkin, I'm now Deputy Commissioner, and just for a very short period of time, really, for about eight months now. Um, and I had a background in healthcare um, regulation, working for the Green Mountain Care Board. And I think that's one reason maybe that I was selected for this job or offered this job is because healthcare is a big concern in the facilities. There was a report out about a year ago about how much is spent. Some people were outraged on how much is spent. Some people were outraged on how it's spent. Some people were saying it's too much, some too little. There's a lot of complexities. There's about, um, let's see, I should know the head count today how many people there are, but we have six facilities here and about 250 people in Mississippi right now. And it's about 1761, I think, today, something like that, all together. And uh, it is absolutely right on what the law is and what people are entitled to. We have to take care of the people in, in um, our custody. It's done through a contractor right now and it will be for the foreseeable future because it's been that way for 30 years, A, and having the setup that Vermont has, having these um, geographically um, scattered facilities, it's, it's not easy when you have competition with hospitals also for medical people and nursing. Um, it, this is the model that's been used, although there's going to be a new contract entered into for the fiscal year next year, and that's not been selected nor negotiated um, quite yet, but it's scheduled to be done this year, and that will become public once that's done. Um, but as you might think, just out of common sense, a lot of people that come into correctional facilities and come into the custody of the department have more serious health concerns. A lot of them come from a background where they have not taken care of themselves, had not had access to health care, have not had access to dental care, um, a high incidence of use of psychotropic medications. Um, a lot of the opioid crisis is reflected in our communities, yes, but it comes to light very much in the correctional centers where I think today there were over 700 people that are getting um, medically-based treatment. So um, it's not an easy thing, and I'm hoping we can always improve it. There's a lot of uh, pressures from our bad infrastructure. It's not conducive to good health to have people in these types of environments. It's not conducive to good mental health. There's a lot of budgetary pressures. It's not a priority to a lot of people to put money into this type of activity. In fact, you know, Corrections has been level funded for seven years and it's all general fund money. So it's not necessarily a popular thing. It is um, it is what not only the law is, but I believe that what the leadership at the Department of Corrections is trying to do is to um, make wellness more of a focus and I could talk more about that later. So um, I'd like to say it's not for lack of trying or bad policy, but Things have changed over years, and I hope that the, the way they're changing um, is, a, is pushing it towards um, better mental health, better opioid treatment, and um, a, a lot of things that have really um, played out and get carried back out into the community. It comes in from the community and goes back out, so. I could hop in for a moment. I am Emily Trito. Um, I just wanted to get a sense of your familiarity as a audience with some of the issues we're talking about because this could turn into very inside baseball with the five of us um, because this is what we do or used to do or sometimes do for a living so who knows what does everyone know what a detainee is anyone okay that's someone where you go to court the judge says bail is five thousand dollars you don't have five thousand dollars so you're being detained so it means it could be anyone who just Today you're walking down the street, tomorrow you've been accused of a crime, so it's someone who's not been convicted of anything. Um, who's had some contact, and this could be professionally, or as an advocate, or as a family member, or personally, and so no one's gonna ask you which one of these it is. Who's had any kind of contact with the correctional system in Vermont? Okay, most people here, but not everybody. Um, I'm asking that because there's, Judy sort of alluded to a reaction every time there's an article about healthcare in prison, or sometimes when there's a death in prison that could have been eased or could have been prevented, um, 
all of the, you know, you get people sort of talking back and forth in the article and quoted in my office, prisoners' rights, being quoted or disability, and then a lot of the comments are just, don't do the crime if you can't do the time, end. And you might not be here tonight if that's how you see it, but you might be, and that's part of the context that this is all happening in. So um, just one sort of nugget of wisdom, since that's our assignment, is uh, that I'd like to convey is that the law that Ed was talking about that says there's a prevailing medical standard that has to be followed, that's very, very different from the bare minimum that's required by federal law. The federal law requires that it not be cruel and unusual punishment, right. which is defined as anything, if it's not deliberate indifference, that's the legal term, if you're not deliberately indifferent to someone's suffering, if you just miss it, or if it's not very serious suffering, then the Constitution of the United States is taken care of. That's a much, much, much lower bar than treating someone the way they would be treated if they went to their doctor's office. Um, and that makes a material difference in Vermont. You know, my office, I wouldn't reduce it to nibbling around the edges, but we're looking case by case. We represent prisoners in litigation in court. We identify cases where we think that the standard hasn't quite been met, or sometimes isn't met by a lot, or sometimes it's met by a little, and we fight that out. But across the board, it exceeds what's required by the Eighth Amendment when you compare with states where that is all that's required. And we see this from Vermont prisoners when they're in Mississippi in prison there. The contract with Mississippi, is, it, is everyone familiar with that, that we send about you know, ninety-five percent of our mill, uh, twenty percent of our mill prisoners out of state. Something. The like contracts that. with the private company, CCA, not with Mississippi. Right. So I'm just using Mississippi colloquially. You're right. It's not with the state of Mississippi. It's with. Um, well, it used to be CCA. What is it now? Oh, Civic Corps. Corps. Civic Corps. Civic. Um, and they're using a county facility. So, but uh, so I'm just using. It. Yeah, the state of Mississippi isn't a player. Uh, now, it is part of the contract that they are supposed to be following the Vermont medical standard. DOC didn't neglect to put that in the contract, it's there. But enforcing it is a whole other question because you're asking medical professionals who are treating thousands of other inmates in that facility to one level and saying, but Vermonters, it's a different level. And without over the shoulder scrutiny um, or someone from Vermont saying, no, oh, this is what we require. How do you ensure that that's happening? And uh, we haven't figured out, at least from my perspective, we haven't figured out how to make that happen yet. So, but the law makes a big difference, and that we're also seeing that. So, a lot of you might be familiar with the law that passed this summer, took passed earlier, took effect this summer, requiring DOC to provide medically ass medication-assisted treatment to people who um, have substance abuse disorder. So that's methadone or suboxone or naltrexone or drugs that help control cravings for opiates and reduce the effect of them so that you don't get high, which is a, you know, when taking opiates so that it's a means of recovering from opiate addiction. Um, and right up until the law took effect, the medical contractor was discontinuing people. There were people who were gonna be detoxed, you know, discontinued from this treatment on June 15th, knowing full well that they were going to have to put them back on on July 1st. And it was grim and ugly, and we took them to court, and sometimes won and sometimes didn't. And what the point I want you all to know is that the law made a difference. And so the legislature choosing to pass that law, your representatives passing that law, made a material difference in the quality of the health care. So these changes can happen, and the legislature can make a difference. It's not just intractable. I mean, some problems are intractable, but things can be accomplished. You know, a little bit I am the uh, former medical director, times two, for the Department of Corrections. Um, and I haven't served since about 2015, I think. Um, and I'm currently in primary care. I will say, though, and um, adding on to what Emily said and what Ed said regarding the, the standards, the um, Eighth Amendment, the 14th, is that the contract generally calls for what is medically necessary. And that's a term that follows from um, Medicaid and other publicly funded um, services that was often used, and I think probably still is, in terms of what um, your insurance company or your pro 
the insurance provider needs to give you or what uh, what that level is and sometimes the the term is medically necessary and I think that's what's been followed for the most part in the um, contracts that the Department of Corrections has had with um, companies in the past and going back to that briefly um, for Vermont has been involved with a privatized system, has had a privatized system since at least about 1996. Uh, and the first was EMSA, E-M-S-A. Why the department, or not the department, actually it was the, uh, the state, the legislature, decided to go with a private contractor. I'm really not sure, but I suspect it had something to do, or I'm minimally sure, um, with uh, the fact that all state employees were being used at that point to serve the, um, to provide nursing care and other types of care. The majority of the people were um, employed by the state and the oversight from the state was with a, um, a doctorate level individual at that point, I think Tom Powell. Um, around the time that the contract came into being, that privatization came along. Um, there, I think there were some events that had transpired, negative events, and I think when states are looking at states or municipalities are looking at should we go with a private contractor or not, should we use our own people or not, there's also a sense of what's the cost going to be, will it be cheaper, sometimes they think it is, they find out probably it isn't. Uh, the second part is the liability, who gets to, to that hit when something happens that contractor will get the hit if you have a contract that says that private company, for-profit company, will hold the state harmless and they will indemnify them in a court of law. So I think there are a number of different reasons for choosing uh, private contractors and I'm not saying that, you know, that Vermont definitely made the decision because of anything that I've said at this point. But I suspect it was a combination of that. And after a while, it also got harder to hire nurses and physicians and other people. And the community physicians, Ed reminded me of this, actually used to come into the correctional facility to see the, the individuals. After a while, that got to be a little bit um, harder and harder. So just a little bit of background, and I'll jump in off and on, and we all will if there's some nugget nugget that we want to add or if someone has a question that we can answer more specifically. Excellent. More nuggets to come then. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tina Hagen with Disability Rights Vermont. Um, so our role is we're the protection and advocacy system for the state of Vermont. So there's a PNA of protection and advocacy in every state. In our um, work in the prisons, we've been um, doing prison outreach for um, 18 years, which I started when I started working for disability rights. And our job going into the prisons is to um, make sure that there's uh, no abuse, neglect, um, or serious rights violations for prisoners with disabilities. So our focus is specific to prisoners who have disabilities. And um, we do outreach in the uh, prisons. We're in there routinely um, throughout the year. And during the outreach, um, what we do is talk with prisoners about what their rights are. Prisoners, again, with disabilities, about what their rights are, um, how to access services while they're incarcerated, if they have a disability, what rights they have, or accommodations, um, et cetera, things like that. So I think my words of wisdom, just having done this so long, and for <coughs> being such a small state that it is, um, is that I approach the prison outreach uh, I never know who I'm going to be meeting with. It's not uncommon that I sit down and meet with somebody I actually know or have met at some point, um, just because that's the nature of Vermont. And um, we just go in for us. Um, why they're incarcerated doesn't matter, so we never ask about what the crime is, because that has no bearing on making sure that their rights are protected as a prisoner with a disability. And, um, and a lot of the work we do is under the Americans with Disabilities Act when it comes to accommodations and care, et cetera. So. Great. All right. That's a very nice treasure chest to begin with. Um, 
And um, I think that the first question that the league uh, would like you to focus on, I mean, in general, our discussion is going to focus on how healthcare in prison compares with healthcare in the community. Um, the first question is about healthcare and medication and corrections. So, can you tell us a little about how access to and quality of uh, healthcare and medication compares to community healthcare? Um, and this may be for all five of you, or maybe Emily, Judy, D. It, 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 as, uh, when we feel like we're done, <laughs> give the give the the wave. I'll give it a start if you want, or can you know? I'll start this one. Sure. We can it up. Yep. So the short answer is it depends. Um, medical care in prison sometimes, in some especially in some types of medical treatment is right up there with the community standard. Things where we, it's very black and white, we can measure easily what someone's issue is and what their needs are. An example I would think of is hypertension. And I don't want to simplify the treatment of hypertension because I'm sure there are people in this room who would say uh, it's not that simple. Um, not only the medical doctor on my left, but yeah. people who might have experienced it. But you know, we never, I almost never hear complaints about prisoners who are trying to get their statins to control hypertension. Um, cholesterol. cholesterol. Well, here you go. <laughs> cholesterol. Um, but in all areas, there's delay that you wouldn't necessarily experience in the community, and some that you would. You know, we've all waited months to see a specialist for something. But for basic stuff, there can be layers of delay. And not because someone's deliberately trying to withhold available treatment, but because there's a scarcity that exceeds even that of the scarcity of medical care in the community. Um, and you, know, you have to, if I got sick tomorrow and said I have this really, you know, you know, a couple days ago I used a chainsaw for the first time, and it was really fun, this is true, but I think I gave myself a back spasm <laughs> from using muscles I wasn't used to using, and if I still felt that way the next day, I could have called my doctor and probably seen you know, a nurse practitioner or someone the, the same day or the next day to say, like, I'm your patient, I'm in acute pain, help me out. Um, you know, what, what do I do, how do I feel better? And if you're a prisoner, it's a little more of a crapshoot. There's a system where you put, submit a sick slip and people are triaging, just like they are in the community. There's not a you know, nurses sitting around saying, you know, I can see that someone's in danger for their life, but I'm just going to not do this. But they have, they have a triage system, and it can be very imperfect when you have people who don't necessarily have a lot of medical education, prisoners trying to articulate what their needs are in writing in a sick slip, um, that there can be delay. And it can be especially difficult if you have an unusual or chronic issue, chronic pain. I realize that we have a separate question for chronic pain, but to me, these all kind of go together medical care and pain treatment. Yeah. Um, uh, no opiates are available in prison at all, which might be a good thing, but if so anyone who has experienced relief from Vicodin or Oxycontin, that is not available to anyone in prison uh, in Vermont as a matter of policy with the contractor there, nor is the drug Neurontin, which is used for a lot of um, neuropathic pain. Uh, you get your teeth cleaned every two years in prison, not every six months. And there's, the thumb is a little more heavily on the scale for extracting teeth rather than filling them. It's not that people don't get fillings, but they might, you know, a tooth might not get saved that would get saved in the community, maybe. Um, which is not to say that the community standard for dental care is that high if you don't have coverage, right? There's, this isn't a problem limited to prison. Uh, it can be difficult to get a hearing aid in prison because sometimes that the need for it is looked at contextually. Well, do you really need to be able to hear everything in prison? You're not going to work. Uh, a woman who is a former prisoner's rights client um, worked with the human rights board and won a large settlement because she had been denied a hearing aid for some time. And she's a very able self-advocate. Not everybody is. Uh, and speaking of advocates in prison, uh, you know, or not, not out in prison, outside of prison. If I had an elderly relative or close friend who I knew would have trouble articulating their needs when they go to the doctor or remembering what the doctor said, you can go with your family member if they consent to you going with them, if they want your help, and be a medical advocate for them. Or, you know, there are some hospitals that have formal patient advocates. 
a patient advocate, an independent patient advocate would be a terrific addition to the correctional medical system. We have prisoners' rights and Tina. Um, oh, I'm just going to add to that. Yeah. I just wanted to finish. Sorry. Okay. Um, but uh, at least my office, we get to interact with DOC medical staff at their pleasure. Um, and when Dr. D was the medical director, she was always very available, including for the 4.29 p.m. on a Friday um, proverbial call, which we always seem to be sending to her. But our advocates on the ground in the prisons get to speak to medical staff as the staff, as their schedule and inclination permits, which sometimes it seems like the more vigorous we, ad we advocate, the less we're actually afforded that opportunity to advocate. So I've been telling you a lot of the ways that it differs. There's a lot of positive and a lot that's perfectly fine, but there are, in my view, pretty big gulfs. Thank you. Um, I was just going to add, when you were talking about advocates in the prison and how that would be a good thing, um, and uh, Dr. D might remember this, but actually the, one of the former contractors did have their own patient advocate um, I think specifically it was, she was um, stationed in the Springfield prison, um, but she was uh, worked for the contractor, and we worked closely with her, and it was a really great um, partnership as far as advocacy roles go, and she was really able to help a lot, and it was a great resource for prisoners, and she just vanished one day. I'm not sure what happened to the position. It, it stopped. Mm -hmm. um, so I would just put that out there that um, actually I think is something that would be really helpful if it came back and beneficial for everyone. Can I give just an example? Oh. Like I'll be very fast. <laughs> okay. um, one of the things that we're looking at now, because there has been a new uh, request for proposal to, because the contract is ending, the a contract that's there now has been in effect for about five years. I think Dr. D was there when and implemented mm -hmm. and was one of the drafters of it. Things have changed quite a bit in five years on what has to be provided. For example, we didn't have any provisions in the contract for uh, medication-based treatment. We didn't have provisions for the um, Hep C stuff. I have some, you know, budget stuff that I received from our budget person who's wonderful to provide it, but right now that contract's a lot of money. And if you looked at what the average expense is, what is paid um, per inmate and the care provided, it's not inexpensive. There's a lot of stuff there. And the pieces that are kind of missing out of it are Perhaps the advocacy piece, we can't release information medically, as Emily knows, without a release of information if it's not within you know, a certain, HIPAA does not allow you to freely share medical data. Having someone inside of the contractor's medical area that might be able to work as an advocate makes a lot of sense. So because as things change, um, one thing we're looking towards is a new contract entered into has to have some better protections for the um, patient and also for com communications to be um, between patient and doctor like you do get on the outside to get some of that um, clearer. Because the number of six slips that come in, I pulled this because I'm sorry that I didn't pull too much information, but there is um, it, yearly last year there were um, well over 11,000 provider encounters. Um, the money paid for dental, dental in the community is poor also if you don't have insurance. Um, it is more than the Medicaid amount um, that, that goes on the average because that's pretty low also. Um, Walk-in visits, there were about 2,500, 70,500 70, prescriptions dispensed. There's a lot of health care that goes into here and looking to a new um, a new contract, we want to make sure that that money is allocated um, wisely and things have changed in five years. They've <laughs> changed quite a bit. Let me correct you, um, Judy. The MAT was put into the contract when I think I negotiated the contract. Um, we also put in the fact that uh, prisoners needed to be either transported to the site where BART, for instance, if they did not have the ability on site to be provided the medication, if they had to go to the clinic, they would. Um, if not, the medication came back in a locked box 
from the BART clinic or whatever the other clinic was to the prison uh, so that individuals would be able to continue their MAT, their medication assisted treatment. There was a lot of time and effort spent into creating those protocols and getting the department, the correctional staff, and the commissioner working, everyone working together to make sure that transportation would be available for those people. We worked with Howard, we worked with a number of other places so that people could be um, seen in a timely fashion so that they were not out all day to get their MAT. But it's been there a while. It's been there for um, several years actually and like we can look back at the contract on that or it was written in as an amendment because the legislature required the department to do that. We did a considerable amount of work and a number of studies in order to demonstrate to the legislature that yes, we were in fact putting that into place, how much of it was being done at that point, and um, uh, the data was there, and then we were going to explore and explode that more in the future, and I think that's what happened. It was we were given an opportunity to graduate, mm -hmm, yeah. to gradually bring that on board, and that is what has happened, as it should, um, within a system when you're exploring and trying to get um, the best system possible. So MAT has been around a while. I just wanted to correct that. in 2017, I believe, because we just had the study no, back. No, it was before that. I've been gone for a while. So. It's been really patient, but I want to yeah. add <laughs> to the correction. Um, just, I think we were on some of those committees together yes. about medication-assisted yeah. treatment. Um, and so it's, it's, it's new that it is in every facility and that it's indefinite. Yep. It, there used to be, first there was a 30-day cutoff and then a 90-day 90 cutoff, day. which does yep. not reflect the community practice with these then, medications. Depending on how long you were going to be in yeah. for was kicked in and then... Which you know, is fair, you know, has no bearing yeah. on your medical needs. Yes. Um, and it also started out, I think, in the Rutland facility and then in the St. Albans facility. I might have that backwards, but it meant that you know, Springfield has the most skilled, you know, most advanced medical facility. Newport has the most advanced jobs training. These are all, the, you know, locations of different prisons for those who aren't familiar. Chittenden has women. So if you have one of these needs and you needed medication-assisted treatment, you couldn't have both. So this is, this is where we've really made a big improvement. Yeah, I, I, I would going to make a short comment on that. This very recent, I remember the argument, or the, I shouldn't say the argument, the discussion in the uh, uh, House committee uh, that I intend, attended really did, my perception was how was the argument for a specific number of days limited as a protocol when there's not an, an analogy in the community. In the community, it's a medical necessity up to the point where it's judged not to be a medical necessity. And so a person, in some cases, might maintain for some, some years on Suboxone or some other um, form of treatment, whereas they had initially tried it, as it was said, it was 30 days, 90 days, and then uh, uh, I think they proposed to the committee, well, yes, you're right, let's go to 120 days. And, and we argued against that, saying, no, why don't you go to the medical necessity as being the standard? And, and which is what I think has been adopted. And, you know, hopefully for the better, we've got, you know, the 700 mm -hmm. people that, were, that yeah. were there. I wanted to point out something that has been um, uh, moving to us at, at Disability Rights Vermont, and I think points up one of the greatest dif differences of what you see in the community and what you see here. Mental health treatment in the community has a long way to go, in our opinion. Mm -hmm. And in my opinion, there is so much in community mental health that is, that is lacking. Um, and, but in the community, if an individual is in a serious mental health crisis, they're going to end up at an emergency department. And eventually, they're going to get a bed. Uh, if they can't be re released safely to home, they're going to get uh, a psychiatric bed. In corrections, very often, what our experience has been, individuals will be segregated, and the, the main fact of that is that there is a physical protection from them harming themselves or others. 
So they may be, their clothes may be taken away, they may be in a suicide smock, there may be any number of different interventions, and the main goal seems to be, and I'm speaking for the experience of the clients we work with, that we will isolate this individual and we will protect them from harming another client or physically committing suicide. And to us, that does not meet the community standard. And very often what we see in cases like that, which admittedly are very difficult cases, um, medication is certainly offered, um, but the level of, of therapeutics that, they, that a person is, uh, that is available, just to me, does not meet the community standard. And now, I would, you know, on, uh, on the plus side of things, there used to be a unit that was uh, very often full, the A unit, and that um, has no longer, is no longer used as an isolation unit for people in psychiatric crisis. And I think, I think there's progress being made, but I think there's a long way to go. And in most, um, in most systems that are the size, uh, a population that we have, first off, there's almost no system that's as small as ours. You know, we're a small state. On the other hand, if you've got a system that is serving the medical needs of 1,800 people, thereabouts, um, there should be some something that is really equivalent to a hospital level of care. And, and that lacks in the system. Sometimes an inmate will be sent out to a, to a, a community hospital, uh, but that does not happen as often as, as we believe it should happen. So I just wanted to put that on the table as one of the differences uh, between community standards and the standards. Let me just charge in here um, Ed, for a moment. This is a consideration, this is a conversation that went on for a long time when Susan Weary back in the uh, 2000 was the medical director. Then when I came on board in 2007 and fast forward to 2015 as I was leaving, the state of Vermont has not invested in mental health facilities for anyone or really good community psychiatric or mental health care. The Department of Corrections, as in true, as is true in a number of other states, since the deinstitutionalization occurred, is still in that place. The Department of Corrections, along with the advocates, have asked in the past on a number of occasions to please do something about this. There were opportunities to put a forensic unit in at Southern State Correctional Facility, an actual forensic psychiatric unit outside of Southern State, the, the facility itself, but still within um, a call, shall we say. We also asked when the state was after Tropical Storm Irene, when the psychiatric facility was no more um, because of that storm, when we all started looking at what the needs were, it was taken to the legislature very clearly that there was a need for a forensic facility. What do you mean by forensic? Forensic meaning to house individuals who might be, um, to having been charged with some sort of uh, crime and needing care, psychiatric care. The other part of that is the Department of Corrections for a long time, and I'm not sure if it still does, received individuals who were in acute psychiatric crises. They were brought in by the um, local constabulary, by the police or the stateies or whomever. Some of those people never received an intake through an emergency department to have their psychiatric needs addressed. We also, during the time that I was there, were receiving individuals who were called D, uh, DPs, delayed placement persons, because there was no room within this current system or the system then to accommodate these people. They were languishing in the emergency rooms, and they still are, some of them. So I guess I really get um, a little bit warm under my turtleneck when we talk about um, mental health services in the state of Vermont. There have been multiple missed opportunities, and it is not just the Department of Corrections 
that has been involved. This is a community issue, and it needs to be addressed as such. Corrections, it's only a part of it. So let me just say, we have moved on to question number two without yes. I even asking it. We just, <laughs> it, it just, they were so well arranged, they it's, just flowed together. Exactly, exactly. Um, and, and to doc, Dr. D's point here, um, this is still an ongoing discussion. Just two years ago, um, then Secretary Gabay had discussed this when I was at a meeting with the legislature. Um, this is this is really a problem for not just corrections, but corrections is where certain people land. Now there are requirements, and the, everyone does get a screen within the four hours. Mm -hmm. But but what do you do? Where do people go once you screen them? If you have no hospital or they came from an emergency mm -hmm. room, they're not going back there. If they're released for any reason and they end up back there, they're right back with you. It it is a struggle. There's not a you know, huge number, but just having a few people coming through the system that shouldn't, everybody knows that's not the right place. Everyone knows, you know, well, where do they go for mental health? Well, what can we do? It's, um, there is not a very clear path for certain people and they are in the not right place when they come in with us. And um, we, you know, when, th when, when someone, when a judge or a court sends somebody in on a sentence, it's not up to the Department of Corrections often to release someone. So um, we, we can't just make that decision on our own. And there's lots of partners in this. And I hope that discussion continues, and not just through corrections and the people we see here that are involved. There's other parts of the justice system that have to really get involved. And communities have to be willing to accept, um, you know, speak to your legislators the, that, that these are needs um, that aren't being met by the systems we have now. So I just wanted to expand a little bit on what Ed was talking about when um, prisoners are having mental health um, crises in, within the facilities. Uh, it's not uncommon that I sit and meet with someone who um, sometimes could just sit there and start crying and we start talking and I'm like, well, you know, I always encourage people, have you talked, reach out to mental, mental health, have you spoken to anybody? And the response, more so than not, is I don't want to do that because I'm going to be humiliated. I will be stripped. I'll be strip searched. I'll be given this smock to put on. And I've seen the smocks. And we all understand that there are safety issues around this. Um, and then I'll be put in segregation. And I just, that's not going to help me. That's just going to traumatize me. So it's really hard to sit and have those discussions and debates with somebody who's feeling like they really need to talk with somebody, but they know what's going to happen as soon as they say, I'm having these thoughts of, you know, self-harm, that's what's going to happen. Um, and the other important part to understand about mental health in corrections is that, um, again, they have no, you know, the difference between corrections and the community. They don't have a choice of who they get to meet with. Um, they get to meet with the providers at the facilities. If they don't develop a, a good relationship with the provider, that's still gonna be their provider. And so a lot of times people will stop seeing mental health because they don't, for whatever reason, it doesn't work for them. Like we can go out and choose if you know we meet somebody and decide, oh, this person's not for me, I'm gonna try another one. They don't necessarily have those options. Um, and then to be seen by mental health, again, it's this, the same as for medical. Um, you put in a six slip and you're maybe seen within three days. Sometimes it's much, much longer. Um, um, one basic challenge that uh, medical staff in prisons face, that medical providers everywhere face, is time pressure. We've all had the experience of going to see a medical provider in the community where you think, well, they didn't, I didn't really get to explain what was going on, or they weren't really listening to me, or and you have, you're left with a bad feeling, like you haven't really been heard, and maybe your, therefore your medical treatment isn't necessarily going to be what you really need. And then we've also, hopefully, most of us have had the reverse experience of like, oh, thank God a doctor finally listened to me and they actually didn't seem like they were thinking about their next patient and pressed for time, even though they must be pressed for time. Um, I don't know the numbers. Other people at this table might have them. But the nursing staff in the prisons do deal with a large volume of people. I mean, Judy quoted some of the numbers about the number of sick slips. Um, and they're perennially understaffed. Um, and I think perhaps mostly with newer staff. I'm just speculating, because I've people I've known who've worked in the prisons for a longer time eventually stopped feeling this way, but there can be some discomfort 
um, with the prison population. No one goes into nursing to say, I, I want to do this so that I can be hostile to my patients or, you know, or mistrust them. They all still have the desire to help people and heal people. But if you think of what can be accomplished when if someone has the time to listen. So anecdotally, we had a patient in prisoner's rights who, um, a patient client, who um, complained of a food allergy. This particular food, tomatoes, made him ill, and he said, I'm allergic to tomatoes. And you know, if anyone here has heartburn, you might, you know, tomatoes are a heartburn trigger. And if someone listened, you know, said, well, why do you, if you say that to your primary, hopefully they say, well, why do you think you're allergic to tomatoes? And you describe your symptoms, then you realize the guy has heartburn. You treat heartburn, you explain how to treat it. In this guy's case, they, you know, you're allergic to tomatoes, let's do an arm prick test. You're not allergic to tomatoes. Too bad, keep, you know, keep eating spaghetti on spaghetti night. <laughs> Um, because you might not actually be able to avoid tomatoes that much in prison unless it's recognized that you can't eat them. And so that's just, it's relatively minor because he's getting heart, you know, he's experiencing heartburn. He's not dying of untreated cancer. Um, but it was just an example of a case where, and it turned into this whole litigation, but where it was about communication, where if he hadn't had the vocabulary to know what it really was, what to describe what was bothering him, then um, something could have been done about it, and I think would have been done about it. They do treat people for heartburn in prison through diet and medication. Um, but he used the wrong term, and it wasn't until we'd been litigating for, you know, grieving it and grieving it in litigation that we, you know, we figured out this is what's actually happening with the guy. And hopefully in the community, everyone should have access to a medical provider who could have that, the time, the luxury of time to perceive what their patient's really saying to them, not just the words that their patient's using. Can I add something? This is, um, this is another just aside to this. One of the ways that um, the department has kind of dealt with some of these in a, in a, a little bit forward thinking, we do have an open ears program. These are not professionals, they're peers. There's a peer program that's in part to help um, recognize some mental health issues that may be appearing um, and, and allowing people to deal with it by speaking to peers rather than speaking to professionals because peers have a better maybe empathy and understanding of their situation. Right now, I think in December there'll be about 35 coaches or some at all of the facilities. Um, they're trained on principles such as um, suicide risk recognition. They do go through a, a training. They also have a hold on their stay so they won't get trained to do this and, and make relationships with people and then get transferred. Um, this is something that was instituted through our director of mental health um, and, and um, substance use disorder. And um, we found that as just an aside, this is not remedying any anything to any full amount, but it is some way that the department has been able to institute a positive, low cost, um, and good outcome program. And I think that that type of innovation sometimes is needed in our situation and talking about advocates and, you know, there's no, there's no one through the health, um, through the healthcare contractor, but we are trying to at least um, work with some of the people who come in. There was a story, I think, on the news just recently about it. You could probably still get it, and I didn't see it. I was away, but I think it's available online, and Stuart Ledbetter did a little story about this Open Ears program. So that's been one way to help supplement some of those stressors and um, catalysts for mental health mm -hmm. crisis, uh, which, because as I said, it's not a natural environment for people to live in. And, and um, hopefully in the state, as there's some discussion of changing some of the types of beds that are available for people to make housing for people instead of beds to make things um, mm -hmm. have a, a, a community that can develop outside of concrete walls there's there's wooden structures there's places with natural light and looking forward that's kind of the the um, push that I know that our commissioner is now trying to make as far as when they're talking about well these failing buildings and these horrible places well then where should people live are there places that can be more like homes? Are there, and that's the discussion that's been going on. So recognizing and that there's um, not probably um, a way to just say everyone gets to live 
in the community without a lock on their door at night. That I, I don't know if that's what's going to happen. I don't see that. But I do see that there's going to be changes in how people house and how they live. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think that a lot of it has got to be related to what we see also as the effects on people's mental health of living in a type of institutions we have now. Let me just say this also. I think we, we all sit here, um, although we don't always agree in the past we have and we won't always agree in the future, but I think what um, happens sometimes is, is the getting stuck on what exactly is normal within a prison setting there's nothing normal about a prison setting. I, and I think if we all start there, uh, the next question then that comes to my mind is how do we make it, how do we optimize what is there and not increase the trauma of being there for people? But there is never going to be, as we know it now, a prison that is a normal kind of place because we keep saying, well, they don't have this, they don't have that, they should have this, they should have that. Some things just are very difficult to provide. It's not difficult to provide respect. It's not difficult to provide time. It's not difficult to provide advocacy. But there are things about the prison and being in a prison or a jail that are inherently abnormal. And no matter what we do, that's not going to change. So I think having a conversation about what are the things that we can change, <clears throat> what are the things that we can make better for people. Being incarcerated doesn't mean that every moment of your life you need to be punished in some way, shape, or form. So I think it's, it's kind of sometimes difficult to push past that. Someone says one thing, I say another, you say something different. And then we never go anywhere with the conversation. So I think listening and hearing from Judy about the positive changes that are taking place is very comforting for me and reassuring. I think one thing that the department could do more of is to advertise and self-promote a little bit better. I've been on the website, and I will say this. It's awful. It's horrible. No, I'm sorry. It's horrifying. If I had the time, that's what I would rather be doing right now. There are no statistics it. I'm sorry. there. There's I'm no apologizing to everyone. Yeah. And that really needs to change. It's gloomy. It's like looking at a, in a prison cell or something. And for a while, it wasn't like that. And we used to be a little bit more self promotional about what medical was doing. I just think informational so, I transparency, think, we don't absolutely. have it right. I look back and I said, why is there a document right yeah. on the front page for yeah. 2017 that's not even oh, gosh, that relevant? Yeah. And yeah. the contract, so, the RFP sorry. just never changed either. Sorry. So I just wanted to, um, a little more follow up on the mental health piece that I didn't get to say was um, when prisoners do have their mental health time um, with providers, um, typically that time is no more than 15 minutes. Um, so it's anywhere, and that's depending on what's going on and um, what kind of day it is um, and what the person's issues are, but from the amount of records that I've read over the years and just recently because now the time spent with a prisoner is actually documented in the records, so you can see how much face-to-face -face time there is. Um, those mental health visits um, typically are no more than 15 minutes. Um, and um, one um, positive plug that I want to give for corrections is in the Springfield prison, they have a Bravo unit. Um, and the Bravo unit is a mental health unit. Um, and that Bravo unit, um, I don't know how much it's changed over the years, but um, it has some specific programs and group activities that they go on for, and prisoners have to meet certain levels of diagnosis and, tr and um, treatment to be in that unit. Um, but when we do outreach at the prison, we don't get complaints about that unit. Um, so that tells us a lot, um, as opposed to the alpha unit that Ed had um, talked about earlier, which was a, um, a closed um, segregated mental health unit where you went when you had disciplinary or really um, bad behavior issues. Um, so the, the Bravo unit, to me, is a, a really positive example of how a, a treatment unit can look in that 
um, it would be really great to have a, one of those units in each facility. Um, or one for women. And one for women, not. yes. And one in the, I no. think that could be a constitutional issue. Well, we've actually brought that case in prisoner's okay. rights before for a client who had acute mental illness, um, who would, a female client who would do well and you know, she, I think, did better than some severely mentally ill women because when she was in any sort of control of her faculties, she was a lovely person and everyone loved her. And it was not for a lack of compassion by the prison staff that she was suffering because they were in out of their depth and they knew it and they wanted her to see her in a hospital. Um, and other inmates, it was, it was really touching, would look after her and could tell when she was starting to decompensate mm -hmm. and would alert people. and. Um, and she was just boomeranging back and forth from the hospital when she would finally become so acutely ill that she would be hospitalized. And as soon as she was stabilized enough there that she didn't physically have to be there in that moment, she'd be back to jail. And it was this cycle. And we brought a lawsuit saying, you need to either build a Bravo unit for women, hospitalize this woman, or make the Bravo unit in Springfield available to women, or open mm -hmm. up the old Alpha unit as a Bravo unit for women. Um, she fortunately completed her prison sentence before we had any sort of a ruling, so the case ended. But it is a constitutional issue that there's mm -hmm. this level of care available to men and not women yeah. because we just don't yeah. have the physical facility. So it sounds like we could talk pretty much all night about <laughs> mental health, and I'm sure there's way more to say. I want to make sure we touch on a few other issues. Um, obviously, the opioid crisis plays into this um, discussion, and. Um, if any of you would like to comment on medication-assisted treatment for opiate addiction and pain medication, just tell us about how that access and quality of these accommodations compares to those in the community. <coughs> we've, we've touched on it to some degree already. Yeah. I would say that with the passage of the new legislation, we are seeing the state um, of care and facilities approaching that in the community, certainly compared to what it was before the legislation passed and before work even before that, that Dr. D was a part of getting some medication-assisted treatment. There used to be none. There's still stigma at the rank-and-file staff level in some facilities. We still have incidents where um, there are nursing staff or correctional staff who are hostile to the idea, and we hear about that from our clients, of people receiving methadone or Suboxone and so forth in prison. And there's one big difference in prison if you're on medication-assisted treatment than if you're in jail, which is that in jail, if you are, there's signs that you're continuing to abuse drugs. So if you come up positive for something on a urine test that's not prescribed or um, otherwise mishandling medication, you might be taken out of this program. Which is not to say you can never be removed from a suboxone clinic or a methadone clinic, but the idea of relapse being part of recovery is, practically speaking, a lot more in practice in the community compared with in prison. We still, pe people can get on it if they qualify now, but they can get kicked off of the program and for a variety of reasons that are not what would happen in the community. Um, and on that note, we have deferred to providers on take, we, we do have um, an issue that we're hoping will become much more minimal over time of um, the medications being diverted and they're worth money. And it's unfortunate because what happens is we, we do leave this, these decisions to the providers, but if someone has diverted a number of times, they might say, well, then you might not really need it. So you've got to come do counseling and come back to us and. 30 days or whatever, and we'll reassess you. Um, so we do have that issue, and it's one that's very difficult. Um, and and we have, as I said, it, it's not really a security issue for us. It's more a medical issue that we want the providers to decide that whether someone is going to be continued or not. And that's how we left it. Um, and I also want to say that this is something that as far as community standards, a lot of it does track what's happened in the community because I just know from my last work when people did have to get on a long wait list to get any type of treatment, um, and that has changed drastically too. So I think that you know maybe they're running sort of parallel in my mind in that now when the need's being recognized also in the community, people aren't having necessarily to drive from Bennington to 
Rutland every day to get their treatment and there's not a huge wait list where you're not going to be able to even do it for the next six weeks easy, I think that that's also what has gone on inside, that there's, there's a recognition that there's a much more immediacy to this whole problem of um, opioid use and um, recognizing that and being, yes, pushed along by the legislature, and that's a really good thing. <coughs> Wakes people up, makes people do things. Um, I think that it holds people, the department accountable for making sure this happens also, and I think at least as far as I know from our leadership, everyone's pretty committed to making this work. We've seen some, we, we've experienced some positive results. Rank and file, always an issue, but that's an issue with the public too, just like the people that say they deserve to be locked up, why would we help them? We hear that from the public too, is why are they getting treatment when they're in? So um, it is a culture that we have to really work hard on changing, and, and I've seen that change for some people, but, which is encouraging. Um, so it, it can happen, and that's what we push for. And it, you know, if the leadership believes it, and if we work with uh, you know our contract and make sure that people understand this, um, that this is something that's it, it, it's you know it, the the comparison is always if you had diabetes and you ate a cookie, it doesn't mean you take the medicine away. You know, like so. Um, that type of thinking has started to permeate, not just amongst people in corrections, but in our society, that people understand this has been a very serious issue and there is a response to it that's a medical response that is appropriate. I wanted to ask um, Emily, I think you made a statement earlier about um, the fact that there are no opioids in prison uh, for anything, not for um, I pain. should clarify, if you're I'm curious, receiving hospice there. care, Mm -hmm. This is a change that happened in 2016. Like, I think this was after your time, mm -hmm. Dr. D, that there was a policy at the Centurion level mm -hmm. saying no more opiate-based medication unless you are terminally ill. And that is how it has played out. There, We've uh, brought cases about that, about pain management. Yes. And the response from the department has been like, well, there are all these alternative ways that are much safer in terms of risk of addiction for treating pain, um, mindfulness meditation, yoga, stretching, which are, you know, those do Correct. help with pain, but they're not being provided. So if, if you're not providing the alternatives, then. Mm -hmm. And I did see that mentioned in the new contract, and we've mentioned it in ours before, that those should be, uh, those alternative uh, treatments for pain should be available. But I am surprised to hear you say that there are uh, no pain relief remedies and, and neuron there, there gabapentin are, is highly yeah. abused by some uh, some people. There are pain medications. There's but, ibuprofen and Tylenol. Mm -hmm. Right. And there's ibuprofen yeah. and Tylenol. Mm -hmm. I, I, and I don't know if that's totally correct. I think there's other things because I know we've had questions and I've looked at grievances right. about what people want and there's, but I don't, I'm not being a medical yeah. doctor, I can't. And I guess, I, I don't know if there's a policy necessarily that says. The, the reason uh, I asked is because they are written policy saying no. this is our plan. About the opioid about based. Opioid based. Yes. I'd like to see that. that. Because there is a, um, a statute that came about maybe 2013 or 14, one uh, that stated if an individual comes into the Department of Corrections on a medication that mm -hmm. is verified by his or her mm -hmm. provider yes. uh, that they were right receiving here. prior to that that medication, unless there is a very good reason for not continuing it, should be continued. I helped write that. So I'm, I'm surprised to hear that, and I'm sure Judy's going to take a look to see what's going on. And, and that I'm not is, sure if they taper those. Like, yeah, if you come right in and you're on a high dose of medication, if you're on a high dose of yeah. Vicodin or something, they might rapidly taper you, but they are not prescribing and they are not continuing that opiate-based mm -hmm. medication unless, you know, so if someone has metastatic cancer and is dying and is receiving full hospice care, then they might give you opiates. I will say as a primary care provider, it's a thorny issue in the community as well. And I think the step therapy is very much supported and being done by just about all providers. Let's, unless you've had surgery and then 
your surgeon is going to say, I'm going to supply you with seven days, a prescription for seven days. After that, you go back to see your primary care. Your primary care provider sees you and says, well, how are you doing? Maybe three more days. So no one's doing extensive extended. There are some of us who still have patients who have been on these medications for years and are not being um, cold turkey and removed or even changed having them changed at all. But I think that there are situations in which um, uh, narcotic medications are beneficial for a short term, generally speaking, for longer terms, um, not so much so. But there are certainly instances uh, where they are needed and for longer than just a week or two weeks and for a little longer periods. But I think that's a community standard that has changed pretty dramatically over the past five or six years. But I, I would have to question, you know, the none whatsoever. The, the, the law, I have yeah. the law that you helped with here about yeah, discon there, there are steps for discontinuing yeah. someone on medication that they come in with and they are entitled to continue mm -hmm. if it's a verified through right. the registry entitled to continue and any any discontinuance has to have a certain process mm -hmm. for doing so. And then I think in the community the benefit if you want to call it that in corrections is you get the benefit the ability to observe the individual in their at that point natural environment um, if I'm telling you that I need five Oxycontin per day because I'm in so much pain, you, you're not in my house, I'm not in your house. When you're in a correctional facility, you're in my house, I'm in your house. I see you, the correctional staff sees you. You're lifting weights in the gym, you're pumping lots of iron. You're not in pain, you're doing fine. So to continue to someone in, under those circumstances absolutely would make no sense. But I think that every case is, is, needs to be looked at individually. So I think sometimes blanket policies um, don't work well. Yeah, and I, I certainly don't yeah. disagree that in a population where addiction is a huge driver of why mm -hmm. they're there in the first place, that opiates don't have a huge danger and a downside and that a mm -hmm. lot of people shouldn't be on them. But um, Centurion did publish this blanket bright line yeah. policy that they use. And it is, um, the, I agree with the statute as, as quoted, but number two in that same statute says, notwithstanding subdivision one of this subsection, the department may defer provision of a validly prescribed medication in accordance with this subsection if, in the clinical judgment of a licensed physician, physician assistant, or advanced practice registered nurse, it is not medically necessary to continue the medication at that time. And I think in the discussion in the committee, the, the point of view about having narcotics in the prison was brought up very clearly, that the idea was we can't have this commodity, it was mm -hmm. described really, it was a commodity. And so they included this section that, okay, if the medical provider, they can, in their judgment, if they believe a substitute can be done. And so I think that's what they do. Mm -hmm. They take them off the narcotic as fast as they can and put it on to other painkillers. And they do, in fact, the number three, which I won't torment you by reading you, uh, does say that they have to record that. That's yeah, essentially they have to what they have to do. Yeah. What they that did. record the decision, the decision they made and why they made it. So the purpose of that was to eliminate to when someone comes in, you're on this, you're off of this. So you have to have that face to face. You have to have a, uh, the individual needs to have a chance to have an assessment done and to read their history. Typically, we don't have community records that quickly within a correctional facility. Sometimes they are available. And in that case, you would know why the individual's been using the medication for what period of time. But there should be um, some time so that that documentation is legitimate and that assessment has some uh, legitimacy to it. So we, we, we've been doing it long enough so that there was a time when a person upon incarcerated, they basically said, okay, we're going to baseline this guy and see what he's, you know, what then reassess and see what they need. Mm -hmm. And that hurt a lot of people, which, you know, which isn't to say that there weren't a lot of people who came into the facility on all kinds of chemicals and getting them out of their system was probably the best thing that could have happened for them. 
I would grant that, but the medical assessment has come a long way. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, given where we are in terms of our time, I'm going to see how, uh, how, whether you're willing to combine the last two questions that we have, uh, especially if there are any questions from the audience afterwards, um, which have to do with privatization. Um, really, just you know, kind of asking you um, whether you know the, the healthcare has, has it affected access or quality to care? What kind of accountability is there for these contractors in terms of privatization? And our final question is about cost. So the degree to which you feel that, that that's related um, or not related, that's fine too. Mm -hmm. um, the, whether uh, you know there, there may be some questions about the cost of healthcare related to, uh, in, in relation to the community mm -hmm. versus in, in prison. So privatization and cost. Privatization has been, as I said earlier, uh, part of the Department of Corrections in Vermont since 1996. Um, and it has continued forward. So about 23 years or so, privatization, for-profit companies have been in the state. Um, each time the contract is rewritten, bids go out, people have an opportunity, companies to bid on those. It's a very lengthy, painful process in many ways because you're taking um, all the statutes, you're combining those, the National Commission of Correctional Health is included in those, in those um, contracts by way of accountability, um, whether or not the contractor has the ability to provide certain things is looked at before they come in, before they are selected. It's a, if you've never been on and the department can open this up, it won't be for a while again, I think, but unfortunately, I don't know how this went this time, but I think in the past we did try to include as many of the advocates and other people as could attend. So that people have a sense of what it actually takes, what's go, what goes into an RFP, what goes into contract negotiations. It's really very um, eye-opening and how much of a um, very difficult and challenging process it is, and a very in-depth process. So privatization, the use of contracts has been around for 20-something years. It is not a decision that the department made. It was a decision that the legislature made at some point and continues to make. Because every few years, there's a study that's called for by the legislature to look at whether or not we're getting the most bang for our buck with these contracts or not, to look at the cost to see whether or not the, the most recent one was done in 2018. Two years prior to that, possibly four years, there was a half a million dollars spent on doing a study that lasted two years and led to the um, last contract that we had. That study was done by, we use uh, correctional oriented um, community health services coaches to come into the state and they were with us for two years and it cost two hundred fifty thousand dollars per year they did a very extensive analysis of what the system was like our endpoint for that was for the purpose of trying to figure out whether or not there were other models we could use rather than the for-profit model we spent a lot of time looking, analyzing, questioning all of you, all of the advocates were called upon uh, to, for input. What ended up happening is that we decided, <clears throat> along with the, um, our consultant, that gee, wouldn't it be great if we could get our community um, health centers, the federally qualified health centers, to come on board with us, because many of them do in other states to help provide these services. It would have been a seamless transition in and out. Unfortunately, we got one bid, and I um, literally went out and tried to walk people through that process of what it would take. Uh, unfortunately, again, they had to drop out because they couldn't meet one of the conditions, and we were uh, really sad about that, but we had to march through this process. Ended up again with a for-profit company. It's not for lack of trying, and the legislature supported that $500,000 effort. Mm -hmm. I think the problem is we keep calling for these studies, but we haven't changed anything. We're still a unified system. We're still six small facilities. We still are spread out over great distances. We still have uh, 
people who have severe mental illness who are housed within correctional facilities. We have lots of challenges within the state, and trying to meet those challenges under a contract is it's difficult, and you do the best that you can do. Um, we're now in the process of choosing the next contractor for the state. But I, th I think the point I'm getting at is this is not a corrections issue. It is a community issue. If you have an interest in seeing something different happen, then you need to talk to the legislature, uh, legislature and say, gee, I have an idea, or why don't we do X, Y, and Z, or why can't we get a little bit better infrastructure uh, for our facilities? <clears throat> and that was something that was looked at not long ago up to, as well. So, um, And another thing I want to point out is it's an, it will be a new contract. Not, it's not necessarily a new contractor, but mm -hmm. some of the lessons learned from the, yeah. these things that the doctor was telling us about that trying to do, we're still trying to do, we still discussed having the FQHCs involved. Some states have their academic medical center involved. Mm -hmm. That's a wonderful idea, trying to have UVM part, the health network partner with us. They haven't, they're not, they're, it's not something that corrections can just decide to do alone, unfortunately. We need legislative backing. We need support from the hospitals if we are going to utilize that um, type of um, input. In some states, it works beautifully. A lot of states have several contractors, mm -hmm. so they might have all the different pieces, mental health, pharmacy, and physical health separated out. Some states say that's very confusing, even though that's how it's ended up. Um, there's lots of hybrid systems. It's not like this is what we necessarily have to do and just keep chugging along, especially if it's not working. I think the way that the department is hoping to make this better now is that the next contract will be different, that the negotiations will end up with something better and less less subject to constant change. Um, and I know that medicine changes and situations change, but, but things have changed a lot in five years. So I, I think that's something we're hoping to be able to implement some of those changes through the contract to really have that enforcement and then, and then have a nice strict oversight over it. We do have um, a CQI program. We do have oversight, but it's not, it, it, it is a difficult thing. We have these separated facilities. We don't have a unified um, health care team in one place, oversight in one place. <laughs> um, we have differences amongst the facilities, and that's something that is a real challenge. And um, we are hoping that we move towards a better contract and um, a more consistent um, application of the standards of care everywhere. And um, you know, with the healthcare workforce shortages, it doesn't make things any easier. But um, being able to hold your contractor kind of accountable for those instead of suffering from those, that should really, in my mind, be something that you know we have a pay for performance. Well, what if you don't perform and you can't get all your contractors in here? Well, you know, that should not be the state that we. Sh that should be something we should be able to protect ourselves with in a contract. So um, there, there is some sort of um, some sort of, I won't say a penalty, but there's some sort of repercussion of not trying to have, making sure there's a fully staffed um, facility and making sure that everyone's, you know, we know everyone's licensed, they have their own standards, but um, we, we really do have to change a few things. I, I even think so, because it's, it, it's a really tough system. Comments on or if I can just the, the silver bullet to my mind of controlling the cost of prison health care, which I think we have what the highest in per person in the country. No, no, not quite. Not country. quite. Maybe after it's, California. It depends on if you're comparing we're, we're apples to apples, apples or yeah. apples and to oranges. Apples are hard, especially exactly. with our MAT that yeah. no one has yeah. and things well, like that. It is wicked high. It's high. Um, <laughs> and we also have the oldest prison population in Vermont. The silver bullet is to let people out of jail. The silver bullet is to shorten prison sentences. There was a bill last year for compassionate release that would allow people to petition in court, people who had not yet reached their minimum sentences, but because of illness, a combination of illness and age, were no longer a threat to the community for them to be released 
so they could receive Medicaid dollars. People can't, you know, the department does not receive Medicaid dollars. Unless they're hospitalized over a certain amount of time. I guess that p bill must have come around again because I pushed that bill for so you long. Me I went out to nursing homes and begged them to try to take our people. Yes. So unfortunately, we, we still it, have that problem. Going around. We still have that problem. Nursing homes out, don't want them yeah, either. Is yeah. a way to, and, and so when, in the mid 2000s, mandatory life maximum sentences were mm -hmm. were passed as legislation through, for a number of crimes through well-meaning legislators just wanting to keep us safe, but the natural consequence of having mm -hmm. life of having people with a life maximum is an aging prison population and a very sick and expensive prison population. And I just wanted to add in about uh, accountability issues with the contractors. Um, it's been our experience. Um, so right now, as far as I know, there's um, DOC and central office does not have a medical director. We do not have a, we have no director for the health service division at this time and have not for several months. So um, the, the previous um, person who was in that position was not a licensed medical provider um, and didn't have, uh, as far as I know, a medical background. Um, and then the, there used to be also, I think, um, a mental health director equivalent position for the mental health. So um, as far as overseeing the contractor, whoever it may be, we had those two positions in central office who kind of were the gatekeepers of what was going on with the medical and mental health services. Um, because there are parts in the contracts as they stand now where there are um, penalties for if the contractor doesn't meet certain, stand, you know, certain requirements they can be penalized, but that's only if somebody says you're not meeting these. So um, I think that's a concern overall just about having those positions filled with people who are qualified to be in them. Um, let me just um, let me just say that we can bemoan the issues of resources and things, but at the at the core of it, I think you have to realize that when an individual is incarcerated, they do not have the freedom that an individual outside has. And if the state does not take the responsibility to either provide the health care or ensure that the persons with whom they are contracting to provide the health care, then that individual doesn't get the health care. And that's, and that's not right. And that's not something that we should tolerate. And the standard should be met and the standard uh, you know good people are trying to do good things I'm not arguing with that but we but I do believe that we would not have as many clients over the years as we have if those standards were well met and then the other thing I was going to suggest should we let people ask questions <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty, pretty close to 830 yes. Yeah. yes that's exactly right yeah so um, who brought a burning question that hasn't been addressed uh, by this Panel. Yes. I don't know that I would characterize it as burning. Very <laughs> uh, focused question. Uh, since I moved to Vermont about six years ago, I volunteered at one of the local community justice centers, uh, doing both restorative program, uh, mm -hmm. programming and COSA, primarily yep. COSA. And I've made an observation that when people come out on furlough, by the way, I love the idea of furlough as, it's, uh, as, a, as different from parole. Uh, they often come out woefully unprepared to live in the community. They don't have the life skills, and primarily, they haven't been helped to get hooked up with medical care and services that they need, except those that have mandated uh, counseling that, that the DOC might mandate. But they come out and they haven't got their medical assistance lined up, they haven't got a hook up with a, with a medical uh, clinic or anything like that. They come out and they're lost. And we at COSA are a very weak read to try to help them. Mm -hmm. uh, we try to get them hooked up. And I, I, I wish that more could be done before their release to get them hooked up. I and think it could make a big difference in their lives. I also think it could reduce recidivism quite a bit. Absolutely. And there should be. And as a matter of fact, uh, in 2013 or 14, when the state was going through uh, its changes and bringing in and um, health insurance for all and all of those things were going on. 
I actually uh, arranged to have a lot of the individuals trained as advocates and the, um, <coughs> as, what was the term we were using? Health um, Na uh, navigators. navigators. So we did a huge training for I don't know how many of our DOC folks, as well as the uh, contractor staff, so that e in each facility there were at least two navigators, two people trained who could do that, who had access to the system, who could get people in for um, to make sure that they had Medicaid, for instance, before they left, or whatever the uh, the health insurance was that that they were able to qualify for. Um, it seems we keep repeating um, things, you know, something happens, it's a very positive thing, then we go along and that falls behind. What happened to that? I do not know, but that is absolutely essential. Massachusetts, where I was also um, a medical director for the state of 9,000 inmates, uh, one of the associate medical directors, it, it's been forever that we have had, or that state has had, the ability to immediately sign you up for Medicaid before you left. You went with your mm -hmm. Medicaid card and you went with your next doctor's appointment. I'd love so, to see that here. I, well, I have no idea and, what, what happened. And coming from the, the world of yeah. um, healthcare, yeah. we've had a lot of problems with our yeah. um, computer systems, with our Vermont Health Connect, and other things that have made this a more painful process mm -hmm. for many people. Um, I think we're working right now with um, the Department of Vermont Health Access on making that, that transition for those eligible for Medicaid, and people are, much more seamless. And I think that's a, a work that's going on right now, and um, hopefully that will happen. That's good to but, but it is, has been an ongoing struggle in getting people the knowledge of where to go. And the whole issue of furlough to me is something else that um, you know, it's kind of a web. There's many kinds of furlough, and depending on where people come in, whether they're put automatically on furlough from the court or something else, they may not even step foot into the facility. So sometimes it's very hard capturing where you get in, where you insert that information. But um, working with caseworkers and others to have, you know, we have some better electronic capabilities now too, and utilizing those to make sure that. If we're all part of the Agency of Human Services, we should be able to say, you step from here to here and you're still covered. You have this coverage now and you're in the community and you, you can go to your doctor. So um, getting that, that together, um, it is, yes, I think it's been going on for a long time, but I hope we're getting a lot closer on it. And it's so very doable. As a matter of fact, the system was set up in that way and Vermont, in fact, has the ability to do that, to make that seamless connection. And it should have been written into the um, whatever that old program was that they use for Medicaid eligibility. There was actually a little kind of turn on place that you could fix that for the Department of Corrections, and it was never done. And I s sat on a number of committees for endless amounts of time saying, yes, but you can do this. You can really do it. It doesn't take a lot. And. Um, Finally, got a little closer, but it wasn't. From, from an on-the-ground perspective, I would love it if somebody coming out and joining a COSA group has in his or her hand medical card sure. and, a, and a first primary care no. appointment. Also, we put into place <clears throat> care coordinators who are supposed to be doing that too, but I won't belabor the point. I'm just getting myself and, a little... And, <laughs> and, and even the whole other thing of people having identification, now you know people have to be provided yep. with identification, which oh, I understand yeah. my my work phone number appeared on the back of by error. So I've had to call <laughs> but, um, but even that is another step towards helping people access other, other community services when it's about. I want folks to know that this is, well, that this is the second of a five part series. Um, so there are three more panels that are gonna be coming. Um, and one of them, the one on January 22nd is about uh, implicit bias on February 12th. Uh, racial bias and criminal justice in Vermont. And to your point, on March 11th, uh, transitioning back to the community after incarceration. Um, so there will be additional times to, to, uh, to talk about this. I want to make sure that people can. It's 8.30. Yeah, it's 8.30 to be in the close if they need to. I think it's okay if individuals want to stay and, and talk a little bit more, but I think we need to make sure that. We have just one more question. Maybe we can skip the last question. One last question. Okay. Um, in prison, there is one God, and that God is security. 
and that permeates at every kind of interaction that occurs between an inmate and staff, including medical staff. And it's responsible for all kinds of problems. Uh, you can always find an excuse not to allow somebody to do something for a security reason. The worst uh, aspect I can remember was somebody read a story about um, a grain elevator exploding from dust. And after that, uh, foot powder, which is talcum, which I don't think can explode, was banned. And it took about a year and a half to get it back. Yeah. Uh, OK, security. The other, another issue is I've been doing advocacy work since, I think, 94 or 96. And it's very rare that I come across medical staff in prison treating patients. They treat prisoners. That's the language that appears on the medical records almost exclusively is the prisoner said rather than you know, the patient. Um, and, and, and here's a question. For those of you that work within the system, how much freedom is there really to use your best medical judgment as opposed to uh, unofficial policy that's been dictated? I no longer work within the system, but um, how much freedom I'm sorry. To use, to As use a the kind of medical judgment you would use in the community, okay? As a, you know, as opposed to saying, no, we don't do it that way. Mm -hmm. I think it depends on the circumstances, the situation, the diagnosis, if you will, um, as far as how much one might push. I would hope that that is the underpinning of everything we do medically, uh, part of the oath that I took. Um, was to do that, was to put my, my patient person first. Um, so that should, it should not be, it can be a question, absolutely. But I think if you really feel that this individual needs something, then you push for that on behalf of them as their um, medical provider. Yeah, yeah exactly. And I just, I want to just comment on that too, is that I see in records that I review where the physicians, the contract physicians at the facilities are doing that. They are suggesting and making suggestions for things that prisoners need for um, their health care needs. But the problem is that that, that gets um, squashed at the, you know, the um, head medical director for the contract. Um, yay or nays, big decisions, and a lot of times they're, turned, they're denied. Yeah, I mean, I think this also reflects the difference between your experience, doctor, as the medical director for the department, and let's say you're the most recently hired nurse in the facility. We've spoken with whistleblowers I agreed not to name who said that they felt they were being pressured by the contractor not to provide the care that they thought they needed to provide their patients because of costs. So it is happening, even though it's not, certainly not the, intent, like, mm -hmm. the goal of DOC for that to happen. It's happening. I think, we, there. I think we need. I think we need to respect people's time and allow folks who uh, need to go at eight thirty to to go. Um, and uh, if you have follow up questions, I think maybe we can just approach the panel. Is that okay? I'm one of those people that really has to go. Okay. <laughs> okay. Can we have a round of applause for our panel? <laughs> through the Department of Corrections, I have a state email address, and um, my name is on that horrible web page somewhere. <laughs> um, and it's on the sign here, so you're welcome to contact me directly. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. you can approach the bench. Yeah. <laughs>